All right, we're getting started. Uh, so this talk is about Nogeri, which is my live video mixer. It's a basic, pretty basic concept. Video, video stream in, uh, stream out, as in like video stream, as in something from the camera, video stream as in something or HTTP or similar. Now, from what I've seen, it's very, very hard to see the bottom half of the screen from back there. So I put up the slides here. If you want to follow along, they are right there. Uh, and if not, then you can pretend to. So let's start with the name. And I have to apologize if there are any Japanese speakers here. Nageru comes from the Japanese word nageru, naturally, which means to throw or to cast. And I sort of like this broad cast, cast now. I know this is not the real meaning, like it's more like to throw. And I also figured out it has a second meaning, to face defeat or give up. And <laughs> I, this was not my intention, right? But this, this happens when you work in a language you don't really know. Uh, now, I promise you, this will be the only bullet point slide I have here. Uh, but I want to get the goals ready because people, even in the free software from the community, has very, very different goals for things. These are my goals. If you don't like them, I have others. Uh, but for the time being, you always retcon goals, right? You make something and decide on the goals afterwards. But I wanted things to be high quality. And by high quality, I mean let's at least do HD, right? It's 2016. Let's, let's at least like work on a laptop. This is, we'll talk a bit about performance. This is my X240, and it certainly runs this full time. Uh, I want to have usable audio tools. Because if you cannot listen, if you cannot hear the speaker, I'm sure people in the back of the room will will, uh, will relate to this, right? If you cannot hear someone, how, why do you even care? Especially for conference video. And there are some things that are nice to have. I'm happy to say that it is free software. This is basically, I mean, suitable for Debian main. Essentially, means not only is it free software, but it also depends only on free software. Uh, I don't have a pony, uh, and I don't have overlay graphics yet. Although it might come. So before I went out and wanted to make a video mixer, I wanted to see what does the rest of the world do? Because I think in the free software world, uh, we tend to get like in this little filter bubble where we only look at other free software conferences. Uh, we think like, oh, this is great. Like I have 320 by 240. This is the state of the art. So I went out and looked at a lot of conference videos, specifically from not a free software conferences to see what is the state of the art? What is, what is the minimum thing we need? And this is from Black Hat 2014, security oriented conference. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty basic. You have up here, you have the slides of the speaker, you have some camera of the speaker, and you have some sort of background. It's in 720p. I think it's even 720p 60. But yeah, this is, this is like the basic. This is another thing. This is uh, from a Bernie Sanders conference coverage. I had no idea these things existed. Uh, but but it's, it's basically the same thing, right? You have like a, a camera. This is probably like a webcam. You have the slides. The slides are bigger. They're picture in picture. Here we have some overlay graphics. Someone has called RMS has tweeted. I don't think this is like the RMS, but it's, it's someone else. Uh, but it's pretty much the same thing. Now, if you go like up one notch, you can just drop the picture in picture, right? This is on PlayStation Experience 2006, 2015. You just do you don't do digital compositing anymore. You just do a backdrop in form of a huge monitor, and this is in 1080p. The gaming world is pretty much in 1080p these days. Uh, finally, I looked at broadcast TV, and this is a Norwegian chess broadcast. This is the closest I came to to like the pacing, and there's a lot of things going on here at the same time. Right? There's all these graphics and whatever, but the interesting part for me is when things start moving around. And I think they will in about like two and a half minutes or something, no, two and a half seconds. Oh, it didn't. I will play it again. Look here, you have all these things, and suddenly they will all swish and swash here. Obviously, no manual operator did this, right? This is scripted. Uh, now, as far as I know, this is made in something that's called VizRT, which is like this big, huge professional uh, graphics software where you have a UI editor. It's probably a bit overkill for me, but it says something about I want a way to make the conference or organizer or whatever have a consistent look and feel of all transitions. So enough about the outside world. Let's talk about the actual editor. Uh, this is the UI without any widgets. It's sort of bleak. Let's, let's start adding things, right? Uh, so first of all, we need some inputs. Now, down here, I'm sure a lot of you cannot see this, but it is two small inputs. And they're all marked 720p, 59, and 94. And I think this is, this is sort of my reference resolution, right? And there are two reasons for this. First of all, I think 720p is really the minimum you can do today. If you do SD, sorry, right? The world moved towards this. I do 60 FPS specifically uh, because there are all these sort of things that are per frame costs. And it's much easier to take something that's already 60 FPS 
and move it up in resolution than to try to take something that's 30 FPS and make it faster, just how these things work, especially when you do GPU, which I do. Uh, and if you look at like 1080p 30, it's almost the same amount of pixels, like 10% away or something from the number of pixels. So 1080p 30, 720p 60, it's, it's more or less the same. So I have two inputs. This is an input. Uh, this is the Blackmagic Intensity Shell. It's very cheap. It's about $200. I think you can even get them cheaper used. And it has almost everything you want. It has HDMI in. It has eight channel audio inputs. It has analog inputs. It does not have VGA. That's the only thing. You will need some sort of converter for that. Uh, you can take mini display port because you can just convert that to HDMI with some sort of passive thing. And it has USB 3. And best of all, it's very, very popular. So it's not hard to find at all. If it breaks, there's literally 100,000 of them. You can probably get one. Uh, unfortunately, unlike almost everything else that Blackmagic has made, there is no Linux driver for it. Uh, so I made one. Uh, it runs in user space. The protocol is actually pretty simple. You set a few registers, it starts throwing audio at you or, or video at you uncompressed over USB 3. Now, there are certain challenges in Linux and USB 3. I think mostly they are now patched. Uh, but this is, uh, this is how things are. Uh, now, after input, we need a process. And here's a dirty little secret. CPUs don't get faster anymore. I mean, we talk about Moore's law to a large extent. Yes, we do get more transistors. We don't get more power. We talk about, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll have more cores, right? But no, desktop machines don't really get more cores anymore. If you look at this graph, this is performance of a typical CPU system from 1995 down here and up to 2015 here. It's a logarithmic scale, by the way. And as you can see, for the longest time, we had this 45% increase per year of CPU power, which we all knew, right? You could just write slow code. It's fine, but because by the time your software goes out, machines will just have become faster, right? You basically double every, every well, not every year, right? We doubled every 18 months or so. But now around here somewhere, this is, this is where things started slowing down. This is 2010. And now it only gets incrementally faster. So what do we do of this? Like, the obvious solution is GPUs are still getting faster. GPUs are still following something like this year over year. Thanks to gaming, thanks to the fact that, say, that things like deep learning are now really taking off, and GPUs are, uh, are doing a lot of that. Now, it follows that we want to do all of our pixel processing on the GPU. Now, I do have this ideal here that if you ever see a pixel on your CPU, you're doing something wrong. Now, I'm not quite at that ideal yet, because it needs to go from here to the USB, and you cannot go directly into the GPU memory. You need one copy. But you only need one copy. Because even though uh, this is a user space driver, there is a way now uh, in uh, USBFS to do true zero copy. This is a patch that I picked up from a guy called Marcus Rechberger, who works in the company that does DVB receivers. Uh, and it's now on the way in the main line. I think it will go into 4.6. Essentially, it allows you to allocate, pre allocate a bunch of memory in user space that, that corresponds to the USB host controller. So just tell it, just put it here. It's fine. And then the kernel does no copies at all. It, the, the, the host controller just DMAs directly into your memory. And you need to do one touch to get it over to the CPU. The other nice thing about this is that you don't have this problem anymore of, well, I want to allocate this half a megabyte of kernel memory for every request. This is not fine after your machine has been run for 24 hours and everything's been fragmented. So it's actually pretty neat. It, it solves both the stability issue that you might have, and it also solves, solves performance. Uh, if you think like one copy is a lot, I have saved so many one copy things in this project. Right? You really, really, every copy you cost, you do, maybe it costs you two FPS, and that, maybe that's not so bad until it takes you from 61 to 59 FPS. Then you're pretty much host, right? And you start dropping frames, and you don't really want that. Uh, pixel processing. Uh, Nagator uses a library that I made and presented here, not in this very room, but at least in Fostum two years ago. It's called Move It. Uh, it basically does all sorts of processing, pixel processing on the GPU by compiling things down into, into fragment shaders. It contains all the building blocks you want. It has gamma pro correct processing. It has nice scaling filters. It has white balance. It actually turns your white into white and not something like white. It has some sort of color space support. And it is obviously, I think it's hard to see now, but this is, the, this is an original picture. And then there are four different copies. There are three different copies scaled with different algorithms. Nearest neighbor. I've seriously seen people in the free software community say, hey, we should just use nearest neighbor, right? For some kinds of content, it's, it's really bad. 
You want things to be gamma growth. This is the one you want, right? This is the one you get if you do something naive. Uh, if you want to hear more about Move It, I will, you, I will refer you to my talk two years ago. Uh, but we will see how it's used. Because uh, the theme, I did not make a UI editor like Bizarre Sorry, this is like outside the scope of the project. But I did make a system for theming. And theme in this sense means everything that governs the look and feel of the presentation. So essentially, the conference organizer or whoever decides the look writes a bunch of Lua. Uh, this is a small, small excerpt of the de default theme that follows Nagero. And it basically sets up movie chains. It says something like, well, I have this input over here. Oh, and I want to do white balance here, and I want to scale it down here, and I want to mix it with this other input here. And move it essentially takes this, inserts some extra nodes that you need, figures out which things should be in which shader, compiles it down to a set of fragment shaders, and makes sure it's fast and, and nice. Uh, and then the theme just basically runtime switches between move it chains. In this case, this is a fade because I had two inputs, and I want to fade within one of them. And it just says when there's time for a fade, because the user clicked fade or whatever, uh, it will activate the right chain. The GPU will do everything for you. And when the fade chain is done, uh, or when the fade is done, it will switch back to a simpler one. It basically just takes, says, take the pixels, apply white balance, put it on the screen. Uh, so when we have this in the Nagata UI, it looks basically like this. I have now six different inputs. Uh, so I have the, well, the two inputs here, which are my card. There's the side-by-side -side view down here. There's a static picture which you can choose. And again, this is, of course, all governed by the theme. The theme can say, oh, you have this many inputs, you have this many outputs. Uh, and most of all, you now have the preview and the live uh, views. This is a thing that's used basically in, in broadcast mixers. It's called ME, or mixer effect. The basic idea is that the operator gets to see, before you put something on screen, you get to preview it. So you always pull things from here, one of these, up to the preview. And then, only then, when you're sure you want to put this on the screen, you click on one of these transition buttons. Now, in this case, you can choose between a cut and a fade. The, the theme, again, design determines which transitions you have. And then you put it on screen. And now, each of these displays is actually a separate movie chain. Uh, yes. Uh, now, of course, there are some things here. This is only a preview. This is not intended to be like full 60 FPS on the display. It's just intended to be a view. Actually, what happens in this case is that since this here is like the side-by-side -side view, but only a preview, the theme here will choose like lower quality rescaling. You can do things like this in order not to burn all your GPU power on like the pretty display for the guy. Um, uh, but now, as we said, everything is, is about audio. So Move It aims to give you, or sorry, Nagera aims to give you proper audio tools. Because has, has anyone here ever had a like, conference video where things were too low? I've had a bunch of those, right? So what do you want? It's a level meter. Uh, there are many wrong ways of making level meters, but this is the right one. EBU has decided to determine like, the ARIA 120 algorithm that actually, after listening tests, corresponds to how loud the things actually sound for you. Uh, so I have proper level meters. You have a correlation meter up there to check your stereo. Uh, it's all good. But you also want some processing, right? You probably don't want to take the cam camera audio and split it directly out to the user. Uh, so I went ahead, and again, I think we can learn a lot from the external world here. I went ahead and did, oh, I asked the sound engineer, what would you do, right? If you wanted to do conference audio, which are the basic tools you need? And he said, well, I want this and this and this. No, 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 no sorry, calm down, right? You, the bare minimum. And said, okay, well, first of all, uh, you want things to be in sync, right? Audio video sync is a much harder problem than most people think. Uh, Nagera takes basically the video from the first card and syncs everything to it. Now, I think we don't have actually time to go through this algorithm, but basically this gives you full, uh, full sync without any perceptible pitch changes. Uh, and it will also give you full, full uh, variable frame rate support. Uh, so if you have like a 60 FPS source, suddenly you switch to 50 FPS, it will actually just work. If you drop a frame, it will just work. Uh, but here's the audio pipe pipeline. It starts, I'm sure this is way too small to, to see, so I'll just say this is a knob and it says low cut. And this is the first thing you want in your chain. You want to chop off everything that's below some sort of frequency. Uh, in this case, it's let's set to 120 hertz, and that's about right for most people. For instance, it will take away any hum, right? If you have a 50 or 60 hertz hum, if you have things coming out from the, uh, from the outer room, you will, you will probably get just rid of this. You don't want this. Uh, and then, 
you want a compressor. This is a very slow compressor. It's called gain staging in this case. Uh, and you want it to set the overall level. This will very slowly try to find like, what is the general level of the audio and try to tune it up to a certain, to, to a certain like, stable state. Uh, after that, we have a second compressor. And this is, a, this is the actual compressor. It actually reacts like, on a 5 millisecond basis as opposed to like, a 10 second basis. It just makes everything a bit tighter. It makes the S's sound like a little, little less freaky in your headphones. It makes every just makes generally voice sound some more level and better. Uh, and there is at the very end there is a limiter. Has anyone ever like turned up the volume and then the speaker coughs? Right, this is the last thing you want. It starts clipping. Like, Whoa! So so this just sits as like an emergency brake in case there is something at the very end that escaped all the other compressors and it just soft limits it. So it's so it ends up nicely. Uh, and finally, we have a final makeup gain that makes sure, because all this has been working like in the objective domain, we want things to be in the subjective domain. Remember those meters up here? They don't really correspond to sound pressure. But this tries again to turn like, up or down the volume very, very slightly to, to get in the right place. And you can even see here, there's this little like, range that says something about how, what are the dy dynamics of your signal. Are you ever peaking? There's this peak meter here. Uh, so you get, you get all these tools. And you also, of course, you also get a cue out from the, from the headphones. Now, let's talk about performance. This is the power usage of my laptop over time, where you can see the x-axis here goes from 0 to 60 seconds and the number of watts for different things. And it starts off really nicely. Right? I, I start off with the package using 20 watts. And after 30 seconds or so, the machine decides, no, no, no. If you ever use 25 watts or 20 watts over time, I will overheat. So it turns down everything to 15 watts, which means that, among others, your CPU, which used to be at 2.1 gigahertz or two cores of them, now is 800 megahertz, which means that you really need to be careful about like, optimizations, all these copings. And I've optimized a bunch of things, like the compressors, the resamplers, the everything. So if you remember those like plus 17% per year, that is assuming you have a server chip. That is not assuming you have a laptop that's, that's ultra portable. Uh, and even worse, I mean, this laptop is rated for, if you look at a GPU and look at the spec, it says 25 and a half gigabyte per second. But in reality, you only have one memory chip, so you have 12.8. And that is read and write. So in reality, you have like five, and you're never at theories, so you're like four. And you need to share this between the CPU and the GPU. So in reality, I think we have about enough to sample 22 times, I think, per pixel, which sounds a lot until you realize that like, every scaling needs like five or six uh, such reads. So, so it is very tight, and I've spent a lot of time actually getting this to, to work well. Uh, among others, I have added some patches upstream to people to, to like, do SSE optimizations, these kind of things. Uh, I've found, uh, I've talked to the Mesa guys. Uh, you can do these persistent mappings to get the driver overhead down. Uh, new OpenGL, whatever. Hopefully, at some point, I'll get computer shader support that works properly in Mesa on Intel. Uh, so you can do a lot of these things I've been doing on CPU, also on the GPU. Uh, but of course, if you just get a faster machine, get, not get an ultra portable, right? It will, it will probably just fly. Uh, and there's one final part that we haven't been talking about yet, and that is output. Now, uncompressed video in 720p60 is about 700 megabits per second. That's fair enough to pull over the network, but it's probably not nice to store. It's 300 gigabytes per hour, and, and that takes up a lot of disk. Uh, we are out of CPU, though. With all this stuff, with driving the driver, with doing this, the audio work, with like, reading things back and forth from the USB, there's no CPU left. But thankfully, the Intel CPUs now have something called QuickSync, which is basically a hardware video encoder. Uh, so we can, do, we can take this OpenGL long, long movie chain here in multiple passes, render it for display, but also render it straight now into the quick sync buffers, where you can say, hey, please just encode this in some nice format. In this case, I think I've set it to about 25 megabits per second, which, of course, you don't want to stream out, right? But you can at least now take it over to another machine for encoding, or it's nice for storage, uh, or whatever. Now I will try a live demo. Now bear with me, uh, because this is uh, very risky. There's a bunch of things everywhere that could go wrong, and already one thing has gone wrong, right? Uh, in the sense that my, one of my cameras was uh, did not uh, did not arrive when I hoped to to use. So we'll just do a one camera demo. Uh, here we are. This is the UI. Now there are no inputs. I will point this now towards 
one of the nice people in the corner, uh, because not everyone in the audience likes to be taken picture of. Uh, now I only have I only have one working input now though, so you can think of this as two different inputs. I can, for instance, set like the white balance on one of them to to a different thing just to be. Uh, what? <laughs> Maybe I should point at something else, right? I'm sorry about this. Uh, they've had a long day, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so I can obviously now pull up different things in the preview. When I click on them, uh, I, can, I can get like, oh, this is ready. This is the one I want to switch to. And I can say, well, OK. You can see, of course, it's not entirely smooth, not the least because I'm using a compositing window manager, which steals like those last 15% of the GPU power that I need. Uh, but okay, let, let me see. Let's, let me say now that I'm. I can also use the uh, the keyboard, and now I want to do okay. Begin a view, new video segment. Choose one, fade to that. Choose with the other one, fade to the other one. Okay, well it's very subtle, right? Choose, fade in here, fade out there, and just to show you that it actually does like 60, 60 FPS. Uh, you can look at the output. Now this is of course like also real stream streamed in real time out. But you also have a recording just to just to make sure that everything is uh, <laughs> is fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did not mean for this to be to be so evil. <laughs> All right. So with that, I think we are almost out of time. So I will take questions. Uh, no, I think that's fine. The questions, uh, if there are any questions. Does anyone have questions? Yes. Uh, do you support several acquisition cards on the same? Yes. Uh, yes. So, so the question is, do you support several acquisition cards? Yes, I certainly do. Now, I do have two here. The only reason I'm not running with two, with two cards is that I was supposed to borrow a camera, and it didn't get, get her in time. Okay. And which card types do you support apart from the black? Wh which card I do support? I support currently these two, period. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they also have a third model, but, but it's, it's very much like this protocol. Uh, the question was, do you plan to support the Blackmagic PCI cards? I think in certain aspects, yes, I will do this, at least if the need shows up, right? Now, uh, I have been aware of doing this because I really, really wanted this to run on a laptop. And on a laptop, you can't really pull in PCI cards, right? Uh, but I will say that the Blackmagic PCI cards are also very good, and they're very easy to deal with, right? They fit very well into what, but currently I have no such support. Uh, also, the Blackmagic so the question is the Blackmagic output. Currently, I don't have an HDMI output of any sort. Uh, again, if the need requires, I might very well add this. Uh, I mean, these cards also have output, right? Well, actually, they have pass-through, but you could have a separate card. The problem, of course, is once you start getting like into, yeah, I want six inputs and an output, maybe you should just buy like an eight in video mixer instead. Uh, uh, uh. We, uh, you mentioned Kafka CG, we, we use Kafka CG for uh, switching three, uh, three SDI inputs to one output, but it's a much uh, larger, uh, longer latency uh, than we uh, have. So, so yeah. So the, the question is, uh, and then is, I'm just repeating for the for the recording, right? You said you the, you, you use Casper CG to have three SDI inputs and one output, but the latency is higher. I think the latency here is typically about five or six frames. Now, Casper CG, it is very nice for graphics. I don't maybe find it uh, a mixer in the same sense, right? Uh, other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, does it work with only free uh, graphics drivers, or does it need anything? Does it work with only free graphics drivers? And I think your question is not what you, what you meant, but it actually works only with free graphic card drivers, because I need something from the Intel driver that's not in the NVIDIA driver right now. Uh, but I would say, though, that I definitely want it to work on NVIDIA because I talk about 12.8 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. My NVIDIA card work has 250, right? I mean, if you have enough bandwidth, you can very, very easily do 4K everywhere. Uh, but the thing that I really need that I don't have from the NVIDIA cards yet is this, pop this thing of integrating with QuickSync, where I can render straight into the QuickSync buffers without having to like, go across X servers or things like this. Yes, another question. Do you plan to support video for Linux? Do you plan to support video for Linux? No, I don't plan to support video for Linux. Uh, I think this is, I mean, 
if I if someone came with like a card that says, "Yeah, you really really need to support this," and it actually is cheaper or better or faster than the Black Magics, I would probably consider it. However, V4L is a very very complicated interface. You need to support like a bunch of codecs, right? And everything. It's very hard to do a full implementation of V4L as a client because the card could basically be shoving everything they want at you. Yes? Would it be possible to use the dual fixing buffers for pushing out two different bitstreams? Uh, so it, would it be possible to use what for pushing out two different bitstreams? In the new Skylake CPUs, you have two buffers for quick sync. Oh, sure, yeah. So Skylake has, has two buffers, as you can basically encode two at the same time. Now, I think this sort of, my, my question is, why do you want to do this? Right? And I think your answer then becomes, well, OK, maybe you want to do this to actually send this one of these streams directly to users. Yeah. Now, I will say that QuickSync is not the most beautiful H.264 encoder out there. Uh, but if you are strapped, if you cannot have a separate encoder machine, probably I could like, turn it into this, use this actual VBR mode instead of the CRF mode that I'm using right now. Uh, and if so, then it certainly is interesting. Now, I don't have a Skylake. Uh, of, course, <laughs> of course, this could be fixed, right? I will say that right now, this is a bit outside what I envision this stream being used for. But I'm, I'm not dogmatic on this. Uh, I can also certainly see at some point uh, using the QuickSync to decode video if you want to just, like, show a loop or something. I think we still have uh, still 10 time questions. Yeah. Any more? Yes, well, uh, back. Yeah, so what is currently the output that you're using the HDMI output from the, the laptop? Uh, what is currently the output that I'm, that I'm using? The current output that I'm using is my VGA output from the laptop. Including the sound or with some, some output? I'm not sure if I understand your question. So what is the output for the sound? The output for the sound is in the stream. Now the output for, for the actual for the queue out for the guy operating this is a normal else output. So so the, the guy with sitting with like to check that all the levels are right and everything is correct, he will get a normal headphone queue out. Uh, but this but the audio itself is just certainly embedded in part of the stream. I mean you don't see this in the demo, right? But there is a web server where you can go and actually get the stream and, and transcode it or whatever. Yes. Um, so, uh, say you're, um, you're hosting a conference, can you provide an uh, example bit of material? What will you need to use this? So uh, the, the like, you need a camera, obviously, but what, what are the, um, the things you need to use this at a conference? So, so the question is, what would you need of equipment to use this as a conference? I think, basically, you need a camera, you need an input card from that camera, uh, you need something, to, like another card to take in from the laptop, I would guess. If you still want to support VGA, you will need some sort of converter. And I guess, well, depending a bit on the conference, uh, you might want some sort of SDI converter, because pulling in HDMI more than, say, 10 meters is, is a bit icky, right? Uh, and you will probably want a microphone uh, for the speaker, and probably a handheld, maybe, so for, the, for the audience. And if so, you'll probably want like, a mixer to pull it in. And finally, you will need a laptop. You don't need a very expensive laptop. Even though this is expensive, right? It's, there are much cheaper and more powerful things, just weigh a bit more. And I think the final question. How do you deal with uh, differences in, slight differences in the um, uh, clock frequency between your audio capture device and your audio output? So the question is, how do you deal with slight variations in frequency between the capture and the output right? of, of audio, right? Now, for audio out, this doesn't really matter, right? Because if the cue out skips like once every hour, it only affects the guy listening. So you don't really care. Uh, now we do, as, as I said, we, we do squish the audio slightly so it fits with, the, with the, the video. So the video and audio will never drift. They will be completely in sync, right? And they will go so slowly that, OK, it might go 0.01% pitch up. That is so small, essentially moving your ear like at, at a kilometer per hour or whatever towards it, it, It's the same thing, right? <laughs> These really, really small imperceptible pitch shifts, you don't really care. Uh, but I do really care about like clocks on, the say, the video cards. If they are out of sync, there is some buffers there. Uh, but eventually, of course, you might lose a frame or, or two every now and then. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.